What words cross your mind when you see this image? I bet brotherhood, solidarity, conviction, and courage. You probably recognize the men sitting in the front row, but hardly the men standing behind them. This image has been seen by millions, but it only tells a part of a richer story. It's 1967. More and more American men are being drafted to fight in Vietnam. Urban rebellions have struck many major American cities and social unrest on college and high school campuses abounds unabatedly. Amidst this turmoil, world-renowned boxer Muhammad Ali publicly refused to be inducted into the Vietnam War. He's eviscerated by the press. Some reporters even branded him as a coward. Others admired his conviction. On June 4th, 1967, he sat amongst a group of 10 men and reiterated to reporters on his refusal to be inducted into the armed forces. The men, who consisted of former and current professional and collegiate athletes, and then attorney Carl Stokes, all stood alongside Ali after failing to change his mind. On principle, they stood in solidarity with Ali and received criticism for their decisions. Just two weeks later, an all-white jury found Ali guilty of draft evasion. He was released on bail pending an appeal, but had his passport confiscated and took a hiatus from boxing. In 1971, the Supreme Court reversed his conviction. The Ali Summit is a well-known story that resonates with sports fans and individuals from all walks of life. Yet, so few can recall that the meeting was held at the headquarters of the Negro Industrial and Economic Union. Members of the union were embedded in Cleveland's Black community, understood its struggles, and used their resources and status as celebrities to facilitate change. Established by professional athletes in 1966, notably former and current players of the Cleveland Browns, the union consisted of a diverse array who were all byproducts of the Great Migration and dealt with racism on and off the field. Jim Brown, the most recognizable member of the union, was born in Georgia in 1936 before his family moved to Manhasset, New York. He recalled the white residents as more racially tolerant than the racism he experienced while playing football in Syracuse. John Wooten was born in Riverview, Texas in 1936, and his family moved to Carlsbad, New Mexico for better economic prospects. Walter Beach III was born in Michigan in 1933. As a child, he almost fell victim to a lynch mob while visiting his family in Southern Illinois after a brief scuffle with a white boy who called him the N-word after losing a race. In Cleveland, all the black players formed relationships with one another on and off the field. In the off season, some players worked as substitute teachers at a junior high school in the Huff neighborhood. Jim Brown understood the plethora of issues affecting the area as he was a frequent visitor. The jubilancy white fans expressed toward black players during exhibition games, rarely if ever, translated into acceptance off the field. I walked off the football field after intercepting the pass running 65 yards against the Detroit Lions. And they took me off on their shoulders and gave me all those accolades and celebrations. Come out, take my shower, and come outside and uh, European, Caucasian, white, whatever, however you want to define it, come up to me with his four-year-old son and said, Walter, 
you sign this autograph. That's football, if it's autograph for my son. I said, of course. I'm signing the autograph for his son. To son. And he looked down at his four-year-old son. He said, do you know who this is? And his father, and the four-year-old said, yeah, a nigga. That's what the four-year-old son says to his father. So I signed the autograph. So on the football, and then I So the guy said, man, why are you signing football? I said, because that's what I do. Ain't that what are we supposed to sign football? That's what I do. I don't raise his son. That ain't my job. That's his job. And his job is to teach his son that I'm a nigga, but I want his autograph. So when we out here playing football, we don't think we niggas. Some of us don't think we niggas. Some of us think they just see us as football players. Pioneered by Brown's business-oriented ideology, the union formed as a self-help entrepreneurial organization in an interview with Ebony Magazine, Brown explained, we believe the closest you can get to independence in a capitalist country is financial independence. Self-sufficiency to Brown was key. Throughout the 1960s and 70s, the union developed training programs for Black workers and provided loans to Black businesses. It sought to initiate programs for inner city school students to expose them to the world of business. By March 1971, the union had 150 Black businessmen willing to participate in weekly seminars to interact with high school students. There is no coincidence that the Ali Summit occurred in Cleveland. Jim Brown and Ali met in person and formed a strong relationship in 1966. Thus, when Ali refused to be drafted, Brown recognized he would need assistance and union members contacted other athletes to come to Cleveland. The union achieved remarkable successes, but overall fell short of many of its goals. Most Black capital went outside of Black communities. Black-owned businesses often lacked the necessary managerial skills and financial capital. Neighborhood exclusion restricted where Black entrepreneurs could open shop. Many of the enterprises the union backed endured no longevity. Nevertheless, the union still operates to this day. Despite its shortcomings, the union represented a significant ideological pillar in the civil rights movement. By promising green power and adopting black power, it sought an alternative to vanquish racial inequality and instill in Black people a sense of racial pride and self-determination.